so we all talk about diabetes management and diabetes prevention i think everything starts right from preconception and that is why it's become very very important because you know we have so many people the burden of diabetes is increasing the burden of hyperglycemia in pregnancy is increasing and diabetes keeps going and on and now we're talking even in terms of primordial prevention which means catching them even before they conceive because that is where the gestational programming for diabetes can be stopped and probably you can make an attempt to actually prevent the occurrence of diabetes altogether so if you look at the idf statistics the hyperglycemia in pregnancy prevalence just going up all across the world anything between 15 to 16% and southeast asia unfortunately leading the bandwagon all across the world 25 to 28% hyperglycemia in pregnancy which translates into one in four live births in the idf southeast asian region being affected by hyperglycemia in pregnancy now the who and figo have actually tried to classify hip into three categories pre gestational diabetes gestational diabetes and diabetes in pregnancy now pre gestational diabetes of course is any woman who's already been diagnosed with type 1 type 2 or any of the other forms of diabetes before she gets pregnant gestational diabetes is di a diagnosis of diabetes occurring any time during the antenatal period and is not expected to persist postpartum while diabetes in pregnancy actually applies to pregnant women with hyperglycemia who were first diagnosed during pregnancy but they meet the who criteria of diabetes in the non pregnant state that means overt diagnostic values so dip is essentially best detected in the first trimester so if you look at the numbers the total live births to women in the reproductive age group in millions you can clearly see 80% of them may be gestational diabetes but then there's a proportion of 20% almost half half each half being a proportion of cases because who have diabetes that is first detected in pregnancy the dip group that i just described while remaining 10.6% are the pre gestational diabetics and like you can see here these days women get married little later have children little later and this is a global phenomenon where you see that the prevalence of hyperglycemia in pregnancy based on age groups as the age progresses the prevalence keeps going up now why this becomes significant is because of all these complications that they can land up in so if it is early pregnancy the congenital malformations neural tube defects and encephaly microcephaly sacral agenesis which is most pathognomic besides a higher incidence of stillbirths and then later pregnancy if there is hyperglycemia polyhydramnia or fetal macrosomia difficult labor neonatal hypoglycemia asphyxia and hyperbilirubinia and for the mother again an increased incidence of miscarriages in early pregnancy or as the prog pregnancy progresses hyperglycemia again increases the chances of preeclampsia preterm labor difficult labor assisted delivery cesarean sections and in type 1 especially acute metabolic complications such as dka or worsening of pre existing microvascular complications both retinopathy proteinuria and edema so this is something which is very very important even before the lady knows she is pregnant that is the time organogenesis has already started so the first 8 weeks are very very crucial because by the time it is 8 weeks of pregnancy as you can see here the heart the upper limbs the lower limbs most of the organs are already formed or almost on the on the way of complete formation so major morphological abnormalities can occur as early as 4 to 6 to 8 weeks of pregnancy now this is a timeline of the congenital malformations clearly showing you that at 4 weeks spina bifida and encephalitis and caudal regression may have already occurred and that is the reason why you need to aim for tight glycemic control just before she plans pregnancy rather than intensifying glycemic control once she has become pregnant so the idea is to aim for an hba1c of less than 6.5% along with of course folic acid supplementation to reduce the risk of congenital malformations that i just described and that is why we see that for each 1% increment in hba1c beyond 7% you clearly see that the odds of a pregnancy being affected by congenital anomalies increase by almost 30% underlining the fact that glycemic control preconception is very very crucial the fetal origin of adult diseases given by david barker again talks of intrauterine 
programming the gestational programming wherein a stimulus like hyperglycemia or any stress occurring at a critical or sensitive period in fetal development can permanently change the structure physiology and metabolism predisposing these individuals to diseases in adult life and that is why norbert frankel actually talked of the fuel mediated teratogenicity wherein he talks of targeting interventions early in pregnancy going beyond glucose that may be critical to improve the fetal growth patterns and stop this ncd ncd pandemic that we are all facing as the woman gets pregnant and as pregnancy proceeds we know in the second and third trimester there is a progressive increase in insulin resistance that happens in ladies with type 2 diabetes and the diabetogenic stress of these placental hormones worsens glycemia not only resulting in adverse maternal and fetal consequences a rapid increase in insulin requirement for ladies who are already on insulin as well as potentiates a worsening of complications and that is why screening for complications preconception becomes very very important so this is cmac data clearly showing that if a mother already has type 1 or type 2 diabetes you can clearly see the relative risk for malformations preterm deliveries lga perinatal mortality all going up multifold so why we are discussing this is because of all these complications and we've seen that especially when it comes to babies born to mothers with type 1 diabetes they have significantly higher rates of being large for gestational age as well as being born with macrosomia and neonatal hypoglycemia which again is important in women with type 2 diabetes especially an increased incidence of difficult births preeclampsia preterm births induction of labor cesarean sections and delivery complications therefore friends pre pregnancy planning with optimization of glycemic control before conception all through gestation and then postpartum has to be very very importantly reinforced to reduce all these risks now this is a paper that actually looks at the lga neonates in type 1 diabetes and pregnancy and looks at factors beyond hyperglycemia and clearly talks of the modifiable factors that can probably improve outcomes so something as simple as maintaining good glycemic control targeting an hba1c of less than 6.5 pre conception and then throughout pregnancy if possible to maintain it at 6% or less reducing glycemic variability losing weight even before pregnancy is planned to achieve a bmi of less than 25 which does have a moderate incidence which has a moderate relationship to the outcomes gestational weight gain has to be minimized and maternal lipid levels even before she conceives have to be but have to be very very standard so pre conception counseling and care in simple words refers to the information care and advice to women with diabetes who are planning to become pregnant has to start from adolescence and has to be ongoing at every visit you need to reinforce the the, the dangers of an unplanned of an accidental pregnancy which are in our, in our part of the world is very very common so it's important to optimize glycemic control and explain that the risks can be reduced but may not be completely eliminated that's very very important so talk about the risk when she is planning a pregnancy talk to her about all the dangers that can happen if it is an unplanned pregnancy and it does not mean only women with diabetes but also in men with diabetes poorly managed blood glucose can impact erectile function sperm count and sperm health and should be addressed during the preconception counseling process you need to talk about the risk behaviors and exposures that can impact the fetal development you need to identify them and change them there has been a positive association between the appropriate preconception counseling and maternal behavior change which ultimately translates into reduced adverse outcomes of pregnancy even when it comes to mothers with type 1 diabetes it's important that you talk about the risk so for example if the father has type 1 diabetes, diabetes there is a 1 in 17 chance of still getting type 1 diabetes for a mother with type 1 diabetes if she is planning the pregnancy at an age which is less than 25 years there's still a 1 in 25 chance but if it if the pregnancy is planned at a later age beyond 25 the chance reduces so it's 1 in 100 Unfortunately if both the parents are type 1 diabetic the chances of the baby getting type 1 diabetes becomes very high almost 1 in 4 So what are the 
components of preconception counseling of course like i said you need to talk about the importance of tight lysemic control and reinforce this at each visit because it's pertinent to avoid an unplanned pregnancy ideally try and achieve an a1c target of less than 6.5% to reduce the risk of congenital anomalies preeclampsia macrosomia and all the other complications that i talked of of course contraception has to be advised till good lysemic control is achieved and also you should tell them when to stop contraception option of course and the choice of course base is based on their own choice and the cultural and the ethnic choices a structured diabetes education through a diabetes care team which is individualized to that particular lady her individualized diet advice exercise advice is very very important all throughout women who are overweight or obese they should be offered a chance to lose weight in line with current recommendations before they plan the pregnancy because we know the adverse outcomes that can happen in obese women who get pregnant and of course a review of of possible changes to the medications that she may be on is very very important besides optimizing glycemic control so this is exactly what the ada guidelines also say the multidisciplinary approach that's required it has to be a team work between the diabetes specialist the maternal fetal medicine specialist the obstetrician the registered nutritionist the diabetes educator were all available so the focus has to be multi pronged like i said talk about the weight management talk about the contraceptive advice screening for complications becomes very very easy the need for assessing diabetic retinopathy because we know there can be a worsening of background retinopathy in pregnancy screening for nephropathy is very important for ladies who have long standing diabetes talk about how nausea and vomiting and change in appetite in pregnancy can affect blood glucose control and how they need to talk about the glucose targets the glucose monitoring that's required the medicines that may need to be altered complications need to be addressed the temporary health problems that may the baby may develop in the neonatal period which may require admission to a neonatal unit as well as the risk of the baby developing obesity or diabetes in later life if glucose control is not maintained well throughout pregnancy so it's very very important that we give some more time to our patients and put in some more efforts to manage diabetes during pregnancy she has to be in regular touch with the hcps and the whole team so moving on to the targets preconception very very important like i said an hba1c of less than 6.5% if this is achievable without causing too much of hypoglycemia which means a fasting plasma glucose anything between 80 to 130 ideally between 90 to 120 and a peak postprandial less than 180 in as which is there in non pregnant adult and strongly advise women whose a1c levels are beyond 10% not to get pregnant because of the multifold increase in con- risk of congenital anomalies that may happen so this was the retinopathy screening that i was talking of a dilated eye exam which should ideally occur before pregnancy or in the first trimester and then she needs to be monitored every trimester as well as one year postpartum based on the degree of retinopathy that is detected again a complete renal assessment before she stops contraception is very very important starting folic acid until 12 weeks of gestation is very very important to prevent the neural tube defect in the baby very important tool is smbg so you need to motivate your patient to do frequent smbg if it is somebody with type 1 diabetes of course ketone testing strips should be made available to her and she should be asked to check for ketosis especially when she is hyperglycemic or unwell because then there is an increased risk of get, uh, getting into keto ketosis standard care involving screening for stds thyroid disease hypertension screening vaccinations routine genetic screening everything is important now again somebody who's got type 1 diabetes or even type 2 diabetes if the duration of diabetes is more than 10 years or there is coexisting hypertension or dyslipidemia it's important to screen even for heart disease so this is where especially in ladies who are more than 35 years of age these days we have a lot of ivf assisted pregnancies coming in where the ladies are beyond 35 years of age so a simple resting ecg may be all that you need or if somebody who's already got diabetes more than 10 and is it a high risk for cvd suppose you picked up a carotid brui for her then a simple stress ecg or echo can help in picking up heart disease as well so this is the checklist that the ada for for the first time has actually come out with 
in the 2021 standards of medical care, wherein they talk about an appropriate nutritional assessment and recommendations. They talk about stopping coffee, caffeine intake needs to be restricted, lifestyle recommendations in terms of getting adequate sleep, which is very, very important besides moderate exercise, a comprehensive diabetes self-management education strategy, then all the different things that I talked about, the complication screening, inform her about the risks, supplementation with folic acid, use of over-the-counter medications that needs to be discouraged. Again, medical assessment and plan wherein you do a general evaluation of her overall, overall health, look for comorbidities, screen for complications, evaluate all the things that are required. And then screening for women who are at high risk for anemia, genetic uh, diseases, infectious diseases, besides immunization and preconception plan should have nutrition and medication plan as well. So it's not only the medicines that you need to look at, but her nutrition and her exercise. So when it comes to the medicines, of course, for a woman with type 1 diabetes, we all know it has to be insulin all the way. She's already, she's most likely on an MDI or a CSI. So that has to be continued. But for somebody who's got type 2 diabetes, remember, most of the oral drugs do not have data on when it comes to safety, except of course, metformin, where again, long-term safety data is lacking. So I think it's best that before even she plans pregnancy, right in the preconception time, she is converted to insulin. A substitution with insulin so that when she conceives, it's very easy to transition and then continue and increase the doses of insulin. So it's very important that you take her on insulin, conv convince her to start insulin so that it becomes easy to uptitrate the doses later once she's pregnant. Of course, teratogenic medications such as statins need to be stopped, ACE inhibitors and ARBs, if she's on any of these, need to be stopped. And maybe you can give her some alternatives like methyldopa or labitalol for her hypertension. Review all the other medications that she's taken. Again, it's important these days, smoking, alcohol in women is very, very common. So you need to review and counsel them on use of recreational drugs as well as smoking and alcohol, which may be detrimental during pregnancy. Again, folic acid supplementation, as well as low dose aspirin at 12 to 16 weeks of gestation to lower the reduce of preeclampsia is very, very important. Insulin, I think all of us know, very, very safe in pregnancy. Most of the analogs, Aspart and Lyspro are approved. Of course, glulizine has limited data. When it comes to the human insulins, I think all of them are safe, be it regular, be it NPH. And of course, analogs have shown to be faster, predictable and giving less hypo. So maybe this is something that we prefer. When it comes to whether it is a pump or a, or multiple daily insulin injections, I think both of them have are reasonable strategies and not one is superior over the other. So it depends on the convenience of the patient. Somebody who needs a basal insulin, especially if it is a type 1 or even a type 2, we know that insulin detimer as a basal insulin is approved for use in pregnancy. But now there's sufficient data that shows that glargine is also safe in pregnancy. So if it is somebody who's got type 1 diabetes who is already doing well on glargine, there's no reason why you need to stop glargine and put her on detimer so it can be continued. And um, I think in the current IDF, uh, Dr. Rutul and I, we present a paper where we actually used U300 uh, glargine for women with pre-existing type 2 diabetes uh, and uh, we did not really see any adverse outcomes. So glargine pretty safe in pregnancy. Uh, this is another review on glargine in pregnancy clearly showing that uh, glargine does not really cross placenta when used in therapeutic concentrations and since you cannot really have RCTs in pregnancy so this is this uh, a lot of safety data is still available. So it's important, friends, that optimal glycemic control preconception is necessary for better maternal fetal outcomes in all women with pre-GDM. Preconception care and planning forms an integral part of planning a pregnancy in women who have pre-existing diabetes. And therefore, it's important to offer information, care and advice to all these women with diabetes and even pre-diabetes or somebody who's already had gestational diabetes in the past. Because for her, most often we see that a woman who's had GDM turns pre-diabetic and then eventually turns diabetic even before she's planned the second because before she gets pregnant the next time. So it's important to tell them about the impending risk of diabetes. And these are again women who need to be offered preconception advice. So preconception counseling has to start from adolescence and has to continue all through the reproductive period of a female's life. Discuss and advise contraception until good glycemic control is uh, achieved, especially when she's planning pregnancy and of course when to stop. Address the importance of glycemic management as close to normal as possible. Like I said, an A1C of less than 6.5 
to reduce the risk of all these complications that I talked of. If, when it comes to retinopathy, if necessary, if you picked up PDR, I think it's important to photocoagulate even before she conceives. That's very, very important. Contraindications to pregnancy when it comes to somebody who's got coexisting diabetes are only ischemic heart disease, untreated proliferative retinopathy and severe renal impairment. Besides this, I think if you can actually counsel her and handhold her, there's no reason why she cannot have a safe pregnancy. Explain the risk of diabetes in pregnancy and how to reduce them with good glycemic control. Review and possibly change medication, glycemic targets and SMBG routine is very important. And this is where a structured diabetes education with a good diabetes care team is of utmost importance. So I think with that, I'll stop sharing and we can move on to our next session. Thank you.